Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Aaron Parrott. I'm a professor of English up at the University of Providence in Great Falls. But last year I also became executive director of Drum Lemon Institute, which is a nonprofit devoted to preserving Montana literature. And one of the first projects that came to me was uh, this Ed Leahy book. And of course I jumped right on it because I was familiar with Leahy's work from the Thin Air Gang. And what I'd like to do today is just talk a little bit about Ed. How many, I'm curious, how many people here knew Ed? Sure. About half. Um, I met him one time. I'll talk briefly about it, but I just want to give a brief background to the book, um, talk about how the book came together, and then some of Ed's close friends from Missoula are here, and we will probably close reading a few of the poems from the book. Uh, but I do want to make clear that the presentation at the Chateau tonight is will be completely different from this. Um, that is mainly a reading of Ed's work and the work of some of his friends uh, who came to town today. Uh, my remarks today are mostly drawn from a pretty long introduction to the book, but I promise you uh, my comments today will be about 10 minutes. And I do want to show some slides. The old minor king of poetry, that's how Mark Gibbons once described Ed Leahy. Dave Thomas called him the chief of us old Montana poets and added, Ed has written poems that I don't think anyone will ever equal. Cheryl Noethe called Leahy my very own Pablo Neruda. And Rick DeMarinis might also have had Neruda in mind when he said, Ed Leahy is that rare creature who I suspect didn't decide to be a poet, but simply had to be one. I met Ed Leahy once, only briefly, at what might, have, might very well have been his last public reading. It was at the Montana Book Festival in Missoula, and I'd gone to hear Rick DeMarinis read, and afterwards asked him if he wanted to go get some dinner or a drink. And he said, well, I'm going to hear Ed Leahy read at the hotel downtown. You should come with me. He's from Butte. By that time, Ed's health had grown precarious. He read some great poems, but Rick assured me in his, so his soft delivery was nothing like it had been when he was younger. I think he stood at the podium in dirty jeans, a bit disheveled, a long beard trailing down his chest, a man on the downside of 70 with a lot of those years logged in pursuit of what country singers would call hard living. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, my own deep respect for Leahy stemmed not from his poetry, but his prose. I fell in love with his novel, The Thin Air Gang, which came out in 2011. A philosophical tale about the horrors of the Depression, a sort of Steinbeckian saga of class struggle and beauty a town in which I, like both my parents, had been born. In Literary Butte, I ranked it as one of the greatest works of fiction to come out of a town that has inspired more than 40 novels. I admired the way Leahy told his tale of moonshine and poverty with, with what seemed effortless narrative ease. The plot never flagged, and the cramped futility that his characters seemed to feel translated perfectly into insights on the especially devastating effects that the Depression had on Montana and Butte specifically. An impromptu remark Leahy made at a reading a few years before this novel came out might well have stood as an epigraph to the narrative accomplishment in that book. This is a quote from a poetry reading where he, before he started reading a poem, he said, quote, you learn something about good and evil when you grow up in Butte. <laughs> the accomplishment of that novel aside, Leahy was a poet and one of the best. He wore the mantle of poets and took it seriously. Poetry was his life. His most famous poem, The Blind Horses, opens at the deathbed of a dying miner, an old-timer who had lived through the fire in the Lexington mine in 1898, in an era when horses and mules lived their entire lives underground, corralled in drifts, worked to death in the dark. After so many years in such conditions, the horses would go blind. The ostensible subject of the poem would be grim enough, but Leahy trains his poetic laser vision on the miner who survived the fire only to die years later in the throes of acute psychic trauma from having brutalized those animals. Leahy's genius lay in his talent for crystallizing those specific moments in the calculus of extraction that made Butte, and by extension this entire country, what it was. He pulls the curtain back on the American dream and reveals its haunted Montana face. I hear them breathing. For most of us, there's something inherently attractive about the kind of people Jesus Christ called the salt of the earth. 
by which he meant ordinary, hardworking people who give flavor to the whole complicated stew of humanity. We call them authentic, noting something especially compelling about their stories and the way they tell them. On the other hand, to call Leahy, a poet like Leahy authentic just means, at least in my mind, that he was the kind of poet who was a poet first, and everything else was subservient or consequent to that primary fact. He lived a hard life like hundreds of other men and women in Butte, but was also a writer who gave voice to what that life felt like, an insider's perspective, as it were. I can talk about his poetry and his genius and what he did for me as a poet, Cheryl Noethe says. He was better than an MFA. He was better than going to a program because he lived it. By any account, Ed Leahy was a force to be reckoned with. Poets often embody contradiction they contain as Whitman, who also was a poet, as he said, multitudes. He was theatrical as a reader, with the rich stentorian delivery befitting a fellow born on the Butte Hill of Irish stock, eccentric to a fault as a bachelor, and an unflinching intellectual behind what Roger Dunsmore called his armor plate of a shirt unlaundered or changed in several weeks. <laughs> he was a great, strong reader and a performer, Dave Thomas has said. Whenever he gave a reading, you got your money's worth out of the deal. Um, and while I only saw him read once, I, I want to tell you that if you Google him or go to YouTube, there are many readings, archives uh, at YouTube of him reading, and it's phenomenal. As much as his singular delivery when reading his poems, Ed Leahy was famous for his storytelling, his off-the-cuff commentary between the poems. Um, one of my favorite moments in one of those films is when he introduces a different price, his poem about a fellow named Haggerty who loses a hand to some, some machinery. And he introduced the poem in this way. This is a little story about this next poem, Leahy began. I once worked for a guy Long pause, end of story. <laughs> Ed Leahy was born in 1936 in Butte. As with many poets, the biography becomes hazy after that. He was a precocious student with a sharp mind, and after a stint in the mines, attended U of M. He also suffered from mental illness and alcoholism and spent several stretches at Warm Springs and other facilities. He didn't publish a collection of poetry until 1979 when he was 43 years old, but it was a doozy. The Blind Horses uh, won the Montana Arts Council first book award that year, the first year the award was offered. 20 years passed before another book came out. That was called Apples Rolling on the Lawn in 1999. Leahy tended to write slowly and methodically. He worked on one poem at a time, working it over until it felt finished. Jack Waller said, quote, he would go back later and make slight revisions, but he, wrote, he was a one poem at a time writer. That was his approach. When Russell Chatham at Clark City discovered Leahy and put out Birds of a Feather in 2005, its 101, uh, 181 pages held at complete works of the poet, who was by then almost 70. Leahy would only live another six years, most of that in poor health, but he continued to write. Nearly everyone who was close to him speaks of his penchant for writing letters as well as poetry. And I sincerely hope that efforts are underway to um, find all those letters and publish those. Good poetry exudes passion, and passion tends to overflow the internal boundaries and become political. Not that Leahy was a political poet, but the emotional response to injustice that you see in his poems was evident in his personal life as well. He was an anti-war advocate early on in Missoula in the early 60s, before Vietnam really got underway. And he was a pacifist all his life. And having been a union man, Leahy understood the purpose and goal of government, which is knowledge that has all but vanished from the current political landscape. One of Montana's best loved and longest serving politicians, former Congressman Pat Williams, grew up with Leahy in Butte, and he said this about his friend, quote, Ed had an innate understanding about politics and a learned perception about politics and government and how it works. The need for rules and regulations, the need for safety, the need for minimum wage, and the need for being able to come together in organizations we ended up calling unions. Ed understood that to the marrow of his bones, the importance of all of that. Williams also said that, quote, Ed understood that some industries, including early day industries in Butte and mining camps like it, put profit well ahead of safety or well-being of either their community or the workers. There was no kidding Ed about that. 
He accepted no apology, no shift right, run left from the apologists for industry. He would have none of it. Because he understood, having grown up in Butte, lived in Butte, he understood the history of what happened over there. And Leahy never lost sight of the importance of social justice. When he took the podium to accept an arts award from the Montana governor, Brian Schweitzer, this would have been in 2008, Roger Dunsmore recounts that, quote, the very first thing he did was condemn capital punishment. The second thing he did was condemn the war in Iraq. I was really moved by his willingness to do those two things in that very political place in front of those people and to use whatever award he got to make that kind of a statement. By the time Leahy gave that last reading at the Florence Hotel in what must have been 2009, it seemed evident he was nearing the end and he knew it. The tremor in his hands had intensified. He moved slowly with a cane, and his voice, once a thunderous growl, had softened to a gritty whisper. His health was failing, and he was a pauper. Ed needed money, Dunsmore recalls. He didn't have much of anything in those years that I knew him in the 90s. He always lived on a shoestring and close to the edge. Jack Waller recounted in an interview afterward that after Leahy passed, he had asked him to, before he passed, he had asked Jack to execute his last will and testament. His top priorities were his intellectual properties, Waller said, because he had very few material possessions. He had very few assets at all. For 75 years, the poet had eked out a living in hard scrabble butte fashion and died having little to bequeath anyone beyond his legacy of some of the finest Montana poetry ever written. When he died in 2011, he left behind him an apartment filled with the detritus of a writer's life. Well-loved and worn out books, dirty dishes in an empty icebox, and stray paper everywhere. Mark Gibbons assumed the task of sorting Ed's affairs and cleaning out the apartment. Uh, the classic old bachelor's dump, Gibbons said. I found 40, at least 40 uncollected poems. He also rescued a manuscript of an unpublished novel, a sort of companion piece to the Thin Air Gang called The King of the Cabbage Patch. Um, and I say to you, it is my goal as executive director of Dumb to see that novel uh, into print in the next few years. After sorting through boxfuls of paper and scraps of writing and performing triage, there was enough poetry to fill the book you now hold in your hands, that I hold in my hands. <laughs> I hope you'll be holding one in your hands after this. It's hard to know whether it's a book Leahy would have put together himself or in the same way, but if anyone knew Leahy well enough to make the right editorial decisions about the last writings Leahy made, it would be Mark Gibbons. Almost everything Leahy wrote that ever made it into the world between the covers of the book came about because someone else who had heard him read or knew his work did the legwork required to get them out there. In the same way that Paul Warwick brought out the blind horses in 1979, and How Waldrop Made Sure Apples Rolling on the Lawn came out in 1999, or Russell Chatham delivered to us Birds of a Feather. Mark Gibbons has done yeoman's work in rescuing the last of what Ed Hate Lady left us and putting in the work to see it through to publication. The world needs as much of what Ed had to say as possible in times like these, and there's no surer measure of the value of your poetry than that your friends will take good care of it once you've moved on. Um, I have a few slides I'd like to show you. Most of these pictures uh, were furnished by Mark Gibbons or Roger Dunsmore. Um, that's a great picture of Ed, I think, probably when he was in his prime. That's the cover of his first book, uh, really a chat book, I don't know, probably 40 pages. Uh, very hard to find. I looked all over the internet uh, for it when I was doing this project and couldn't find a copy anywhere. And then I went down to Aunt Bonnie's books and found one on the shelf there for five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the cover of Birds of a Feather, which came out in 2005. Um, like I said, 180 pages, and it contained every poem that the author had written up to that poem or up to that point. So if you have Birds of a Feather and you buy this book, then you will have the complete works. Uh, the Thin Air Gang, that's the cover of the novel. I really can't say enough great words about this book. One of the things I loved about it in Literary Butte, my, my book that I wrote about Butte literature, um, and I actually gave a lunchtime talk a couple years ago on this book. 
um, and I talked a lot about this book of Ed Leahy's. One of the things I love about this novel is that it doesn't talk about the Copper Kings. Um, it talks about Butte during the Depression and moonshiners and that part of Butte life. Poverty. It's an amazing book. Um, this is my shameless self-promotion um, that I'm really putting up here to remind you that one of the things that makes Butte great is that so many novels have come out of this uh, city. For a city its size, I don't think there's anything anywhere in the world that can compete. Uh, also, poetry, and I don't talk about poetry in this book. I focused only on novels, but I could have written a companion of all the great poets who've come out of Butte also. I love this picture. Um, to me, this represents the sort of introspective side of the poet. A lot of thoughts in that head. Uh, here he is getting, uh, I'm not sure who took this photograph. My guess is Mark Gibbons, maybe, or Roger Dunsmore. Do you know Mark? I'm not sure. I think I know him, but he's not around here. Uh, this is when he received the Governor's Arts Award, the highest award for the arts that you can get in Montana. Um, and that is uh, Congressman Pat Williams outside there. And I think what's going on there is Ed is signing a book to him. I forget where I read that. Um, That's that hometown celebration after the Governor's Arts Award. Yeah, excellent. There's a Rhodes Gallery. If yeah. <laughs> um, Ed is flanked there. Uh, let's see, do I have a pointer here? It's Mark Gibbons, Victor Charlo, Roger Dunsmore, and Dave Thomas. 40% of those people are here today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can talk them into reading a poem or a book. Um, so, this is a photograph that I think illustrates the state of Ed's affairs when, when Mark rescued this work. This is the kind of stuff that he found, which became this book. Um, that's not a very clear photograph, but um, this probably was written before the last days because you can see his handwriting is pretty solid there. Mm -hmm. I can't quite read what that says. What? Oh, the bomb went off in front of Wilhelm's flower shop. Yeah. Yeah. What does America mean to hear the bomb went off in front of Wilhelm's flower shop? America. That's it. Uh, there it is. What does America mean to do? Or to me. Mean to me. Again, um, you know, he probably worked on this poem before the before the end because the handwriting doesn't show the, the real tremor that he developed. Um, apparently, he had great difficulty writing toward the end. And Did he have also, or, um, Parkinson's or something? Um, manganese poisoning. Oh my! How wow. does one get manganese? Poisoning? How does that happen? Um, he worked. Uh, knocking shale out of some mining equipment oh my goodness. as a young man. Uh, I think what I read, he had a five pound, they just sent him down there with a five pound sledge and what? his job was to knock all the scale off of the inside of these boilers. Oh and it was goodness. mostly manganese. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Which apparently is not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is the book here. The cover, that photograph was taken by Eric Heidel up in Great Falls, great graphic designer. That's a great picture. Um, I love it because I told him, I said, I want the cover to make very clear to people from Butte that it's Butte. Yeah. But yes. for God's sake, do not put a gallus frame on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's and I think he nailed it. Yeah, it's a great picture. Um, and I guess what I love about the cover is that, you know, somebody seeing this somewhere else in the country will recognize it for what it is, a cityscape, you know, but it could be Chicago or New York or whatever. Uh, but I think people from Butte will right away. Yes. This is the Drum Lumen Institute mission statement, and I hope you'll sign up to get our newsletter. Uh, in the last three months, we've put out two other 
books, a novel by Rick DeMarinis called The Burning Women of Far Cry that went out of print in the 1980s, and I think it's one of the greatest Montana novels ever written. Um, and the latest collection of poetry by Roger Dunsmore, one of Ed's friends, actually one of his former students. Um, but the, I want to read this because I think it I think it's important to promote and publish art and literatures created in Montana and the broader American West, to encourage, promote, and commission critical writing about cultural productions, including film, video, visual arts, literature, performing arts, food, scientific discoveries, architecture, and design created in Montana and the broader American West, and to research and publish scholarship about the natural and cultural landscapes of the region, and to produce and promote audio recordings and film and video documentaries on a variety of cultural subjects. Um, we're filming this today in part because one of the women who contributed to this Ed Leahy project specifically requested that we do this at the archives. So I'm honored to be able to satisfy that request. Um, further on in this mission statement, which is really about three pages long, there's a line in there that says we give priority to works that have been neglected. And I think that's true of Leahy's work. This is a, a broadside hand printed by Peter Koch that was one of the premiums we gave away, well, essentially uh, sold in order to fund the book. Um, and that is The Blind Horses. Um, maybe we can get one of our fellow poets to read this poem. I, my guess is if not today, they will do it tonight at the uh, Chateau. Um, and here's a movie, here's a broadside that I did from a, from a poem of this collection. I think it's the perfect title for this collection and it's a great, great poem. Um, this was printed with handset type using 1880s technology. This is one of the more interesting things. That's a, that's a stone with uh, this poem and carved into it by an artist in Missoula. Um, how, what's the size of this? Do you, do you happen to know, Mark? I don't remember. It's, I don't know, it's probably about a foot by half foot, something like that. Okay, so, you know, about the size of a large book. But that's stone, and Dirk Lee somehow etched that in there, but there you can see the tremor in his writing. Oh, and now they can't find it? And yeah, this, this monolith seems to have disappeared. Wow. So if anyone knows where it is. Wow. Um, we tried to track it down for this project you know, hmm. to feature it somehow, but this is all we have is a photograph. <laughs> um, I will leave this poem up here for you to read, but I wonder if anybody would like to read a poem or two from this collection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on up. We have it like 30 minutes here, is that right? Yeah. So this is Mark Gibbons. He's the guy responsible for this book more than anybody else. <laughs> Do I need that? Yes, yes. please. Yeah. Any words? Yeah. That work? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> wow. Uh, so I, I, uh, I came to Ed kind of late. I mean, I knew who he was. You know, he was anybody who was interested in poetry in Montana. You uh, you knew who Ed Leahy was. You you'd heard him read, and uh, and of course he was he was uh, cataloged in in the last best place that that collection of work that Montana literature they did in the 80s, and so. I think I, I read his, those two poems there and then immediately went out and found The Blind Horses. But before that, I, hadn't, I knew who he was, but I hadn't read him. And so 
maybe uh, maybe just to, uh, to to give you that out loud. And of course, Ed is out loud. That's that's the way you should have experienced him. Unfortunately, he's not here to uh, to do that for you. So I'll go ahead and read. I'll read this since you mentioned reading it. And then I've got one more. The, I'll, I'll give you the two poems that were collected in The Last Best Place for Ed Leahy. And if you're familiar with Ed Leahy, you're familiar with both of these poems. And the first one was the title poem, The Blind Horses. <clears throat> the old man in the hospital bed with his horny yellow foot stuck through the stainless rails claimed that July night the one he picked to die on, he smelled sulfur on his gown. When he was my age, he worked the lower levels of the Lex in a great underground corral, yoked iron tongue to wagons filled with ruby silver and peacock copper rock, flaked sweet hay to horses, shot the worn out. Dozens of tramway horses hauled hard against whipple trees, rubbed the timbered tunnels clean, pulling down the cribbed up drifts, brass lanterns swinging, work bits in their teeth, slick with mine damp and cold to the touch. Dry stalls in the crosscut cave of that stone corral caught fire in 98. The horses, tunnel blind from lack of light, burned up in the green flame that licked the lagging black in the Lexington mine. I met his eyes cracked white like a drunk's who hasn't had a drink in months. He said he could hear hoofbeats ring and click against the granite footwalls. He complained of being cold. His nostrils flared. I hear them breathing, Ed. That, that poem kicks your butt on the page, but to hear Ed Lady read it out loud is, is another thing entirely. And this poem, I, I taught, uh, along with another friend of ours here, Robert Lee, we taught in a organization in Missoula for years taught kids poetry in the classroom and one of the assignments that <clears throat> I always used and I'm sure Robert does is a, a, a it's called a portrait poem so it's a poem in which you know a, you, we get a portrait of somebody and and so this uh, this particular poem I kind of know by heart but I've got the cheat sheet in front of me just in case <laughs> I go oh, oh. I can't remember, uh, but uh, it's about, uh, it was dedicated to his dad, who was referred to as Big Ed, and it's called Gimp O'Leary's Iron Works. <laughs> Ed used to say that, uh, that this was his Ars Poetica, his uh, poem on poetry, and, uh, well, I'll just read the poem, it speaks for itself. You hear a lot of lies about O'Leary, but he could seal a crack in steel, no matter what the size. His arc welder would strike white fire, and a blue-black rod would slide along between cherry streaks, and acrid smoke would curl away to leave clean, married steel, not too frail or buttered up, but straight and strong, hard as mill-forged rail. Of course, you might say, don't use that example as a metaphor for poetry. Welding is a matter of utility, and you'd be right. Still, I remember the look on his face when he'd lift his great helmet and sneak up on the finished job with his unprotected eye. It was always between him and the piece of steel, a struggle of molecules and will. Often others would say to him, damn good job, or some such thing, and if it was, he'd grin and look again as if he thought the natural light would show a flaw 
or bridge that didn't fuse. Convinced, I guess, that in his struggle with the steel, he could seldom really win. He knew perfection could conceal the wound beneath the arc of his art. I liked him for that. <laughs> That's it, lady. Uh, so I'm going to read just a couple here and then ask a couple of Ed's other friends and fellow poets who made the trip over uh, if they're if they're interested in sharing something with you also. We're going to do a program, as Aaron said, tonight over at the, at the Clark uh, Chateau and, and we'll read a, a lot more stuff, including some of maybe our own work because Ed was, uh, as Dave said, the chief of all of us old Montana poets. And uh, I, I mean, I've got virtually probably a book of poems written just about him. I mean, most of us, he was a model for the generated uh, poets. He was just an inspiration. So uh, we'll spend some time doing that. And uh, did you bring your guitar? Ooh, we're breaking out the music <laughs> in the Clark Chateau, too. This guy, he does everything. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me read you a couple of things. Uh, as Aaron kind of mentioned, the story of finding this stuff, it was, uh, it was crazy when I, I, I mean, I had to, when I cleaned up, you know, like those papers and, and his apartment and stuffed this stuff in boxes, because no one wanted it, and it was either the dumpster or take it home with me, and then I knew I couldn't throw that stuff away because this is Ed Leahy stuff. And so I went through it, and as I went through it, I say I found basically the poems that are in this book and just kept setting something aside when I would find it. That interesting, uh, uh, that hand-scrawled note up there, you know, I, oh, just, just to mention, I didn't, I mean, this was Ed, Ed and uh, Ed, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do much to edit Ed Leahy. I just couldn't. So some of these poems are, they seem to be uh, a little unfinished or a little awkward in spots. Most, a lot of them are probably first drafts or drafts that never went anywhere. They just got buried in the slush pile. But they're good enough. They're all, I, I mean, I, I think they all stand on their own. There was a couple of them that I took a couple of liberties with, just because you're in this position. And you kind of, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. And so I, I and one of them was, uh, one of them was a poem that is, uh, it has to do with that note that you saw uh, up there, that hand uh, scribbled note about uh, Wilhelm's flower shop. Where is it? Uh, let me read that. Uh, oh, there it is. There you go. Pretty sure. Yeah, this poem, it was a scrap and, and it was like a start and, uh, and, and it, it didn't go anywhere and then I found that scrap and the title was on the poem, and so I just used the title. It says, Unfinished Poem. <laughs> Hooked to a lover's string, out of the gray tank, into the Kmart, wearing Salvation Army garb. One eye shut from fear, the other blind. As a computer number hacking on a bank back from Virginia Guide and the cornucopia of old dreams, a cushy Packard's wheels, and the winter the bomb went off in front of Wilhelm's flower shop. What does America mean to me? Another uh, sort of odd thing that I discovered in uh, in the process brought to my attention by by the, the person who put this book together, uh, Nan Parrott, Aaron's wife, uh, sort of did the, the groundwork on assembling this whole thing. And she discovered 
that we had a poll that was duplicated, or at least two or three of the first stanzas were duplicated. And I, I had gotten by me, and partly because of the way it looked on the page here, and the way he had, they were in regular stanzas here. So I put these poems back to back, or we did, when we decided to draw this to our attention. And I don't know why, what happened, and I was hoping that maybe Terry might be able to shed some light on this whole thing. But the title of the first poem is called Crazy Quilt. And, uh, and, and then the second poem is called Sweet Williams. And the second poem I got from Terry, uh, and it was given to her as a birthday present from Ed. And after I saw, read the two poems and, and had them next to each other, and I thought, I know what this is, I think, without ever having a conversation with Ed, because I found myself doing similar kinds of things. I think he used the first two or three stanzas of another poem that he really liked, and then he finished it out with a stanza for you. So I'll read that poem that he wrote as a gift. Uh, this is for Terry. It's called Sweet Williams. There was no secret in her eyes, though they were perhaps as old as God's. What they offered was hard ground for a too quick desire to waste itself upon. Like ground I knew, and mountains too, lakes, trees, rivers, that she blends with honey in a comb, surrounded by pine bark and pitch, the sound of wind taking the snow away. The spring makes itself known, the earth groans, the flowers grow. Fill her windowsill, her bones grow calm, cats curl in lazy circles of the sun. I may put on the dog again, find my way off stage, get interested in artichokes, and leaf by leaf go in. So I should turn this over to somebody else to read something. Uh, thank you all for supporting uh, us, Drum Lumen, Ed Leahy. And uh, as, as, as a last uh, note before I turn this over to Robert or Dave, whoever's next. Uh, one of the things I found in common after uh, getting befriending Ed like a couple of years was that my dad was born in Butte, as was Ed, of course. And Ed was told me one day, well, I'm celebrating my birthday tomorrow. And I said, tomorrow is your birthday? And he said, yeah. It's like July 8th is your birthday? He said, yeah, I said, that's when my dad was born in 1917 in Butte, so that was wow. pretty cool. All right, who's next? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Robert Lee. Yeah. 
And uh, I will read you more tonight. I thought right now, uh, I just read two poems. Um, one that was mentioned uh, earlier uh, about Haggerty's hand. It's called A Different Price. Topside, a bull gear caught Haggerty's hand, slick iron on a wet day. I heard him speak to it. Whoa, he said. It cut his hand off anyway. <clears throat> to release the claim and settle the debt, officials gave Haggerty a hoister's chair in a never sweat. Last week, his ghost hand missed a grip, dropped six men a thousand feet. The company will pay for that, I understand. <laughs> And now it's from the blind horses, which I am lucky enough to have a copy. And this is from Apples Rolling on the Lawn. Old Butte Rat. <laughs> I will not end up like the beggar with a sign that reads, Need Food, even though, of course, honesty may be everything. I think a philosopher should have something to talk about, a writer something to write about. I have never been able to do more than declare I am a chip on the foamy river, and on the chip, hey, I say, I'm still afloat. Uh, Rumi wrote, beyond ideas of wrongdoing, beyond ideas of right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. I wonder who might bring the bread. That's what I wonder. Why a field? I'll meet you in the alley, I say. <laughs> of course, I am from Butte, not silky Persia or smooth move America. Still, it is the Indian paintbrush flowers and bear grass that get to me as I fork through the sausage of current affairs, remembering the sacred little mining operations of the past. It is also a sky without contrail. To gaze at the heavens now is to peer through a shattered windshield, cracked up by lawless, noisy aircraft. Sometimes I catch a glimpse of blue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dave Thomas will go up next. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> She used to come over to Butte and hang around. Uh, I first, uh, I heard about Ed actually probably before I met him. I was, uh, I was introduced to his poetry in an English comp class at the university when I was a junior. I remember most strongly a poem called The Confederate Shacks. That stuck with me. And then, during the Vietnam War days, we were caught up in all the demonstrations and uh, the political, whole political thing. I, I was exposed to him. Uh, I, I, <clears throat> I began to understand what poetry is all about, listening to Dad read one night from uh, Theodore Reske's uh, long poem, The Lost Son, over at Paul Warwick's house. And uh, I never really got to know him real well, though, until uh, 
he moved over to Missoula after his final stint in Warm Springs. And, uh, and we would hang out together, and he would, uh, it was very encouraging to me as a young poet or younger poet, you know. And, and uh, we, he, he would, uh, he would uh, send me uh, poems in the mail, the letters and stuff. And those are, and it was uh, very uh, helpful to me. To, uh, and we would meet up every once in a while, and, and uh, here and there, you know, one time we met up on a uh, city bus, and uh, I, it, would, it inspired me to write this little poem. You know, Missoula Bards, Saturday afternoon. Leahy and I ride the number nine bus. There's few old poets, we agree, having known each other 30 years or so. Maybe once we were Han Shan and Lee Po, riding the Yellow River and drinking wine, instead of this bumpy jaunt down South Third Street in a diesel burning machine. Blue Mountain, not our destination. Looming just the same. And what during that particular time period when Ed was living out there on South 33 years old, he wrote a number of poems actually, and one of them that I like is called The Death of Apricot Trees. Death of apricot trees. A zingy whine of saws in old Mizzou reminds my ears of a sound quite different. The old steam whistles of Butte's hoist boilers. The speculator's dreadful summons to the men. Board the cages and descend. I know when I walk out upon the grounds and I'll see the sawdust in the snow where the gnarled trees grew that bore the apricots I picked last summer with a pretty low ocean woman, affording us such sweetness we never got over smiling at one another, even when we met in the laundry room. I know they will be gone, I was told. The management post notices upon our doors, sends runners, besides, I have listened to the saws a long time now. A modern zing, quieter than the ancient redneck saws. A snarl I almost miss, like the great shrill steam whistles the hoisters pulled full blast every New Year's Eve in Butte to welcome in another year. Even Montana birds have history. The trees, the sacred red metal, here before we were, the fruit and ore, the working earth, bears, turns queer upon the tidy law, becomes shrill engines that we hear. The dull, busy drone of traffic, the impersonal whir of wheels, AK-47s, the B-1 bomber overhead, the clash of spears at night in the back bush of Zaire, I know I exaggerate, old friend. My feelings have been hurt, and I am hardly fair. Have yet to throw out my TV or try it to lease Ted Kaczynski's cabin. <laughs> but here, but in this lonely, in this cozy apartment complex, I have met much loneliness and fear. And when I finally get the nerve to walk outside, I know I'll meet men in goggles. Proud to say, cleaned her up. Damn flies won't buzz about the shitty fruit this year, next year. <laughs> and I would like to read uh, an elegy that I wrote for Ed. On the death of Ed Lady. This cloud has been with us all day. I walk in the bite of the wind. 
It has been a long winter with only hints of spring, tentative buds. A throb of cyberspace gave me the news. You had been a report of ill health for some time, yet remained a presence in my mind. I first heard of, heard of you through your poem, Confederate Shacks. We studied it along with Eliot's The Love Song of J. L. Ufrock, English composition class, my junior year at the university. A year later, in Paul and Jenny's kitchen on Wiley Street, your voice ringing with rare passion, reading from Rethke's The Lost Son, made me realize poetry was more than print on a page could indeed be personal. Hard years fighting against the Vietnam War, bad chemicals, obscure battles in Butte, disappointment teetering on the border between reality and contentment. You found a home finally in Missoula in productive years. Books emerged and your voice ever strong gave life to the blind horses in Gimp O'Leary. That day in Helena, an old bear, not yet toothless, decorated with the governor's medal. You stood tall with a mighty roar, even as you knew that no smoke rises from dead shacks and life is moving. As now you move through <coughs> some zones, your great voice ringing strong in memory still. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. I thank really hope to see you uh, at the event tonight. And I'd like to close with the title poem from this book. I think it's pretty appropriate and one of the most beautiful poems I think I've ever read. It's called Moving On. I give you the rain, its long, hollow room all the way down to the street light, yellow under midnight. I give you the sound you can hear when drops are talking to themselves while you are staring from a front window. I give you this final letter. You can fold it again and tuck it somewhere while you walk back to the fireplace and look out at the 30s in Hollyhocks. If you toss it into the fireplace, when you arrive safely to watch the small fire, I will be happy to see it flame. Up the draft into the night and the rain which I give you knowing there is not much else that I have other than all of my love. <laughs> Thank you.